I'm going to be talking to you today about benchmarking progress in AI and two projects that we've been doing uh, recently that go in this direction. So I work in natural language processing. And as you probably know, if you work in AI, NLP has been undergoing a bit of a revolution. And this is largely due to these huge pre-trained language models, very deep transformers trained on huge quantities of data that are transferable to all kinds of different tasks. So the, the classic examples by now are things like GPT, uh, GPT-3 came out the other day, and the Sesame Street models, so Elmo and Bert and other models that build on top of those. And we know that we're undergoing a revolution because of the progress we're making on the benchmarks in NLP. Now, benchmarks, they really play a crucial role in uh, driving progress in AI research. The canonical example, of course, is MNIST, which was introduced in 94 and uh, on which it took us 18 years to achieve near human performance in 2012. ImageNet, it took us six years to achieve superhuman performance, which is respectable if you compare it to NLP, where the recently introduced Glue benchmark, which was supposed to uh, be a long lasting benchmark for us to really measure NLP progress on, was actually saturated in less than a year. Uh, and as a consequence, we now have Superglue, which has also already been saturated. So that means that we are really making very fast progress. And um, so on the one hand, maybe you could be pleased with that progress, but it should definitely give you pause for reflection because what is actually happening is that while people on the outside think that we are making very fast progress in NLP and headlines are that human performance has been surpassed on benchmark so-and-so, Actually, if you're a practitioner in the field, you know that we are very far away from having real natural language understanding. So when we saturate a benchmark, that's not a happy moment, but it's actually a very sad moment because it means we have to go in search of a new benchmark um, and something that actually captures what we're really interested in, in this case, natural language understanding. Um, so what I will be talking about here are two projects that revolve around doing benchmarking, perhaps in a slightly smarter way so that we can have benchmarks that last longer and that actually measure the thing that we care about. The first project is called Adversarial Natural Language Inference, which is a new benchmark to do exactly this sort of natural language understanding progress measuring. And the second project is the Hateful Memes Challenge, uh, which is a new data set and competition that was specifically designed to measure multimodal reasoning and understanding. Okay, so the motivation behind this project on adversarial natural language inference is, to put it in the words of Shakespeare, that there is something rotten in the state of the art. And what I mean by that is while it looks like we are making this amazing progress and these state of the art models are really uh, developing very rapidly, that might be deceiving. Um, so in fact, these models might learn to pick up on artifacts in our data sets or uh, pick up on random biases that mean that they don't actually learn the problem we care about, but that they just learn to sort of overfit the data of the particular benchmark in question. Uh, so there are some very famous examples of this. Uh, so in SNLI, you can do really well by just looking at the hypothesis. In VQA, if you answer two to a how much or how many question, you can do amazingly well. So these are the sorts of biases that, uh, that exist in data. And uh, of course, what we want to do is we want to be able to measure the real thing, the real scientific question we actually care about. So what we can do is we can take inspiration from the philosophy of science, uh, which has uh, attempted to characterize the way we make progress in science. And uh, so if you think about what happens when we have these artifacts in data sets or if we saturate a benchmark, um, uh, what happens is that there's a bit of a revolution where the field needs to figure out like, okay, how do we fix this benchmark or what is the next benchmark going to be? How are we going to measure the progress uh, on the problem that we actually care about? And then of course, everybody needs to figure out what the new benchmark is and then everybody needs to agree. And then uh, until at some point there's another problem that we find with it or we uh, saturate that benchmark. So progress that we make here is sort of cyclical where we keep coming back to these model revolutions and then a paradigm shift and then a lot of sort of boring science that we do in between. And uh, the basic idea of adversarial NLI is that we can embrace this loop and we can apply it to uh, Shakespeare's problem of uh, having a rotten state of the art through this uh, method called Hamlet. So Hamlet stands for human and model in the loop enabled training. And uh, I'll just kind of walk you through this diagram here to, to make sure you understand what this is about. Um, so the problem here is natural language inference where given a context and a hypothesis, you have to predict a label. 
Um, so what we do is we give a target label and a context to an annotator, for example, a mechanical Turk worker, and we tell them to provide a hypothesis that fools the model. We give the context and the hypothesis to the model, and we look at the model's prediction, which we compare to the annotator's target label. If the model was correct, okay, that's a good example, maybe not super interesting, but we can still use it, so we'll put it in the training data. If the model was wrong, that means that it's an interesting example um, because we now have an adversarial case where the model fails, but humans would actually get this right. And of course, we need to check that humans actually get this right and that the annotator didn't make a mistake by asking a verifier or a set of verifiers if they agree with this example. If they disagree, we throw away the example. If they agree, then we can add it to the training data or uh, use it to construct a dev and test set. And uh, this test set can then be used as the current benchmark for state-of-the-art methods, uh, which uh, could be the model in the loop here, which might mean that that model would actually get 0%. If it's only, uh, if it's only one model, it could get zero uh, accuracy on this test set because they're all adversarial examples. Um, so if, we, if we've if we done this for a while, we can then train off the new model on this collected uh, training data, do model selection on this dev set, and then collect another round of data. So we can keep going with this. Uh, and so in a sense, we have humans in the loop here for collecting the data against models in the loop. And then there's this bigger loop of scientific progress where at some point we saturate this test set and we need to collect a new uh, round of data. So I should say that this uh, human and model in the loop stuff is actually not uh, a new idea. There's a lot of very cool work uh, that's been done in NLP and in other fields around the same line. Uh, so for me, this really started with this paper, Mastering the Dungeon, Grounded Language Learning by Mechanical Turk or Descent, where we really showed that you can use Mechanical Turk workers uh, to iteratively collect uh, very high quality data uh, for training, and that this is of higher quality than just static data. Um, so if you want to look at, at this for yourself, you can go to adversarialnli.com and you can see an example uh, of, of how these models behave. Uh, so just as a reminder, the context here would be something like all men are mortal and then your job is to come up with hypothe hypotheses like Socrates is mortal, uh, but have the model misclassify it. So the possible labels are entailing, contradictory or neutral. So uh, one way uh, that might be uh, useful uh, for thinking about this as an analogy is uh, that our annotators are sort of white hat hackers and they're trying to find vulnerabilities in our models, in our systems. Uh, and then we can collect all of these vulnerabilities and patch them for the next round. So we can make our models better and better by collecting these adversarial examples where the models fail. So we apply this process over three different rounds. In the first round, we use a BERT model uh, and the domain of the context is Wikipedia. In the second round, we use Roberta models, which are stronger than BERT. And these models are trained on all of the initial NLI data, as well as the data that we collected in the first round. Uh, and and the, the contexts here are also uh, from the Wikipedia domain. And in the third round, we also have Roberta ensemble models, but we uh, explore different kinds of domains. So it's not only Wikipedia data. And, and in the third round, we also train on the data from the second round. So we keep going where we collect harder and harder uh, test examples, hopefully, and uh, our models get stronger and stronger by training on this training data. So I'm not going to actually talk you through all of the boring tables with numbers. I'm just going to give you some of the main findings. Uh, so the first one is that you get the new state of the art on existing NLI tasks. I personally care about state of the art stuff a bit less. Uh, what I think is much more exciting is that as these rounds get uh, collected, they get increasingly more difficult, which means that the target models get better and the annotators need to work harder. So their error rate of the model sort of goes down, which means that we're really making progress uh, on this problem of having annotators talk to models. So it really also sort of measures the thing that we actually care about. Uh, the collected test sets are very difficult. So if you take the uh, current state of the art models like these Roberta ensembles, they fail miserably. Uh, so GPT-3 came out recently and uh, it doesn't perform above random uh, uh, for most cases. Um, and so the, the one that I personally think is very interesting is that we show uh, that dynamic adversarial data is of a higher quality than static data. Uh, so that means that maybe you can be more data efficient and you have to collect less of that sort of data, which uh, would be a good thing. Um, and the bottom line, of course, is that natural language understanding is far from solved. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and that's that's something actually that we put in the paper and that Gary Marcus picked up also, picked up on also, uh, you know, where 
Um, if, if Turkers can very easily uh, exploit these models, that means that they don't really generalize in the right way, but they just pick up on statistical patterns in data sets that maybe we don't care about that much. Uh, so the fact that Turkers can easily fool these models also has, has advantages because it means that we can really do this sort of dynamic adversarial data collection at scale, uh, embrace the scientific loop and hopefully make faster progress. And the cool thing about this is that if we ever surpass human performance, then we could also just uh, you know, could collect a new round and start again uh, without having to go in search of a new benchmark. Um, so in the limit, uh, this might get you to natural language understanding, uh, arguably, uh, if, if you assume that we are not lacking any of the sort of modeling uh, tools that you would require to solve NOU, which I personally actually think is the case. Uh, but more practically, this will, of course, make your models much more robust, uh, which is a, is a very good thing in the short term. Cool. So in the next project, um, we care about multimodal reasoning and understanding. Um, and uh, so if you work in VQA, then I'm hoping that you will find this interesting as well. Uh, this is the hateful memes challenge. And um, this is a, a data set and benchmark as well. Uh, but in the previous case, we cared about natural language understanding. And in this case, we care specifically about measuring multimodality. Uh, and so if you work in VQA, uh, then you will agree with me that multimodal problems are super important uh, and they're all over the place, right? So if you look at the internet, it, it's very rare that uh, something happens unimodally. So it's never just text or just images. There's all kinds of modalities that, uh, that happen together. So um, uh, uh, thankfully, we've made great progress on, on this area already through uh, things like VQA, which has been very important for driving progress in vision and language as a field. Um, but with some of these benchmarks, it's not always clear to what extent these problems truly require multimodality. So it could be that you're just picking up on unimodal aspects that allow you to answer these questions. So motivation question of this work then is, can we try to design a data set that requires multimodal reasoning and understanding to succeed? And if you're designing a data set from scratch, then you can specify what your desiderata are. So in this case, uh, we would like it to be easy to evaluate uh, we want to have clear licensing so that people know what they're allowed to do with the data and what they're not allowed to do. And we want to have real-world applicability where if we make progress on this problem, then it really directly changes the way we do things in the world, uh, which, uh, of course, is nice. Um, so the, the problem we settle on is multimodal hate speech. Uh, so here are some nasty examples. Uh, and if we are able to, uh, to catch these, uh, then that would have a direct real-world impact. And uh, on the unimodal cases of these, uh, where it's very clear uh, what they're saying, um, then uh, this is relatively straightforward to detect, and, and we have systems that can do it. But the multimodal cases are actually very difficult, uh, as, as you can see in these examples. So they require a lot of external knowledge, uh, world knowledge, common sense. Uh, there's multimodal co-reference happening, all kinds of difficult problems that we don't really know how to solve yet. So the way we define hate speech uh, in this particular case is as a direct or indirect attack on people based on characteristics, including a whole bunch of different characteristics. And then we define attack as violent or dehumanizing speech, statements of inferiority and calls for excuse, exclusion or segregation and mocking hate crime, uh, such as the Holocaust is also considered hate speech. So as should be immediately clear from this definition is that you can't just give this to a mechanical Turker and expect them to do a good job. You really need to invest in properly training annotators because this is actually a very subtle problem uh, that you really need to think very deeply about. But the advantage of having a definition like this uh, is that it yields a binary classification label uh, where you either take something down because it constitutes hate speech under this definition or you don't take it down uh, even though it might be uh, uh, offensive or whatever, but it's not actually hate speech. Um, and then, of course, uh, distributing memes. Uh, if we are designing a data set, we want to be able to distribute the data set and have people do research on it. Uh, and for that, you want to have clear licensing terms. So uh, uh, instead of just uh, grabbing memes off the internet somewhere, what we did instead is we partnered with Getty Images so that we could synthetically reconstruct in the wild memes uh, where we get new background images for the memes uh, and uh, Getty license these background images to us so that we can distribute them for research purposes. So that means that we have very clear licensing terms about what you're to do, what you're allowed to do with this data. 
And uh, the way we measure uh, uh, multimodality um, is through this concept of a benign confounder. Um, so let me illustrate that to you. If a meme is multimodally hateful, that means that you should be able to modify the image as well as the text to flip the label to not hateful. So here's a here's a here's an example uh, where you have a skunk and it says, love the way you smell today, uh, or a, a tumbleweed in the desert and it's look how many people love you. So I should say these are example mean memes because I don't wanna have to show you actual hateful examples. So these are not really in the data set, they're just used here for uh, illustrative purposes. So what we can do is uh, we can modify the image uh, to make these uh, memes not mean anymore, but benign. So uh, if we replace the picture of the skunk with a picture of a rose, then suddenly this becomes a benign image confounder where it's a very nice thing to say about someone or look how many people love you and it's a big crowd of people. Now, of course, I could also swap the text uh, to say, love the way skunk smell or look how many people hate you. And in this case, the label is also not hateful. So you can apply very subtle changes to one of the modalities in such a way that the label flips. And these are what we call benign confounders. Um, and uh, since these are also included in the data set, that means that you have to look at both modalities and understand the relationship between both of them if you want to be able to succeed at this problem uh, because you need to distinguish between all of them. Uh, so just to step you through how the data set was collected then, uh, first we uh, have a bunch of memes. We select those memes. We do some basic checks to make sure they're in English, for example. Um, and then uh, for the ones where we can find an image on Getty as a replacement, we uh, construct a meme from them. We annotate those memes uh, according to the definition I provided earlier. If the meme is found hateful, then we can uh, do this uh, benign confounder creation step uh, for both the image and the text, uh, and we add these to the data set as well. So um, in the end, uh, let me just step you through those. So in the end, uh, that gives us a data set of uh, 10,000 examples. Um, and uh, so that might sort of sound small, maybe if you're used to the, the bigger data sets that, that people have been using in AI. Uh, and I should emphasize really that this is a challenge set uh, so uh, it's uh, the annotators were very high quality. We had to get these images. There's a lot of effort that that went into collecting this data, which means that you can't really do it at the, the huge uh, scale that some other data sets are. Uh, but that's okay in this case, because it's not really meant for training on its own anyway. Uh, what we really want to measure here is to what extent we can fine tune existing multimodal uh, vision and language models on this problem uh, and have them be successful. Um, so what we did uh, in the paper is we uh, compare a bunch of different multimodal models. The metric uh, we, we measure here is uh, the area under the ROC curve. Uh, we also include accuracy just because it's easier for, for people to interpret. Uh, and we compare a whole bunch of different fusion methods and multimodal uh, models. So what's interesting to see here is that you get a sort of hierarchy of sophistication where models with very elaborate fusion like Visual BERT and Vilbert and MMBT perform much better than slightly less sophisticated methods like a, a simple concatenation or late fusion, uh, which perform better than unimodal uh, text or image only models. Um, so the other interesting observation here is that multimodal pre-training, the, the final two rows here in this table, doesn't actually seem to help much yet. Uh, and as you can see, we are still very, very far away from human performance. So that means that there's a lot of room for improvement in trying to explore different ways of doing multimodal pre-training. So what we hope is that this benchmark will become a benchmark for measuring exactly the sort of multimodal pre-training progress that we are making as a field. So in order to encourage people to work on this important problem, we are organizing a competition at NeurIPS uh, hosted by Driven Data. Um, you can go to ai.facebook.com slash hateful memes to see more details. There's 100K in prize money. Uh, and the desired outcome of this competition is really to have people think about new multimodal models or new methods for multimodal hate speech, or maybe both, uh, that can really have a real world impact in, uh, in addressing this problem. So the goal here is to spur innovation in multimodal methods. It's not necessarily for us to take your code and run it on our internal things. We really want to uh, encourage people to work on, on this sort of important problem. Uh, and we know that benchmark play, benchmarks play a crucial role in driving progress. Uh, and that's exactly what we, we want to do here too. Uh, so there's starter kit code available in uh, MMF, a multimodal framework, which is on our Facebook research 
uh, GitHub, uh, and that should get you started on this uh, on this challenge very easily. So, in conclusion, I would like to thank uh, all of my collaborators on these projects. Uh, you can go to these URLs here on the slide if you want to see more about them. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to my talk.